Um, we're incredibly excited to have you here today. We're going to be talking about reinvestment, uh, specifically getting into some of the ideas that are in the residency revolution uh, report that was just recently released um, and exploring all of those ideas. Uh, prepare to teach members. We can quickly wave, wave at everybody. Um, we'll be here uh, with you along the way as we go through a lot of these ideas. Um, I'm Zach, I'll be taking some of your questions and lifting those out, um, but I'm gonna be passing it on uh, to Hannah. Great, thank you so much, Zach. And if you have any tech questions, you can reach out to Charlotte today. She is our technology wizard and ever helpful with helping people troubleshoot. So thank you. Um, and if we can start screen sharing on slide two, that would be great. Uh, today, we're here to talk a little bit deeper about one of our recent reports, The Residency Revolution, which really focuses on making a bold case for districts to think about what they are really investing in and thinking about all of the dollars that a district spends as an investment in something. And we want to invest in high quality equitable teacher preparation. And so we are going to dive deeper today into how we can think about uh, funding that districts have differently to be able to support a uh, teacher candidate pool that is diverse, that reflects the um, uh, the student population that they're going to serve and that is able to afford uh, to go uh, attend a high quality program so that districts can have um, really stable pools of candidates to pull from and so that you, we can have fully and well-staffed schools for all of our children. Uh, so if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, this report and this webinar are part of a series of reports and webinars. So we have um, four different case studies about how to support sustainable, quality, equitable teacher preparation. Uh, we also have a report called Dollars and Cents that talks about um, making really a, a case federally for funding and talks about some of the barriers to teacher preparation um, as it exists right now. And one of uh, those barriers really being um, the uh, pay and the dignity that teachers deserve. And um, we also have uh, a sixth report in the series, if you can believe it, um, related to specifically to candidate financial um, burdens and going a little bit deeper into some survey data that we collected from throughout the country. So if we can go to the next slide, um, like I mentioned, um, this is one of three case studies, and, or sorry, three case studies on um, the three R's. We have another case study on building ownership and engagement. Um, the first of our three R's is reallocation, and that is really focused on partnerships, reallocating roles uh, to be able to fund resident stipends. Then we have reduction, which is very much preparation program focused and really uh, charging preparation programs to think about how much their programs cost candidates and look for ways to maintain quality or even increase quality uh, while reducing the overall cost to candidates. And then today's report that we're looking at is on reinvestment and really rethinking the way um, that we spend on not only HR costs, but also instructional costs as well, so that we can really um, have a great source of teachers coming in uh, to our schools. So if we can um, toss it over to Karen DeMoss, she's going to share a little bit more about this vision behind fully staffed, fully prepared teacher workforces. Thanks, Hannah. And thanks all of you for being on here. I know some of you have practically moved in with us this week. We thank you for all of the time you've given us. And um, we 
celebrate the fact that we don't have any events next week that you've got on your calendars. So you might have a little free time before the long holiday weekend. Um, but we do hope um, for those of you who've been in attendance and all sorts of things with us this week, um, that, that some of these things are going to be supportive for you. So that's certainly our goal. Please let us know to that end whether we're succeeding. Um, I am going to go through kind of the case for this work at the district level really quickly. Next slide, Charlotte. So if you think about pathways into the teaching workforce, we have since, especially since uh, the 2001 No Child Left Behind Act, which encouraged the development of fast track alternative programs, uh, officially encourage them. Um, we have a lot of fast track training programs, about 30% of our candidates across the country and in some states up to 60% of candidates come through fast track training programs with as little as a week. Um, sometimes they'll have a month of sort of summer prep and then they're teachers of record um, and they are a, a big way to solve workforce uh, gaps. So if you've got a, a, an opening in a school and you don't have a teacher who's applied for it, these kinds of programs are helpful to fill those. Historical preparation programs are the second approach, and that's what some people call traditional, though if you actually go across the country, um, there's no one thing. Um, so there is no such thing as a traditional um, versus an alternative. There's lots of variations and alternatives are inside higher eds, but the historical way of basically having a semester of student teaching um, from a university, um, often, most often in terms of numbers from the undergrad, that's sort of the historical preparation programs. And then there are these deep, deeply partnered residencies. So those are the three pathways. Next slide. If you think about how these pathways help us fully staff schools, the historical preparation programs have a slight disadvantage for districts uh, because when somebody goes to a college, they don't necessarily intend to stay in that college town. So they were gonna go back home all the time. And so they may not be, they may be preparing in your district, but not necessarily staying in your district. And so they are not necessarily the best approaches to fully staffed schools. Deeply partnered resident teacher residencies, um, including uh, the, the San Francisco Unified School District has had a 10 year residency that they think has helped stabilize their teaching force to a sum of zero. Um, open positions in the last couple of years. Um, deeply partnered teacher residencies can actually address fully staffing schools and fast track training programs also can do that. So if you go to the next slide, you get a different picture about a fully prepared teacher workforce. So historical preparation approaches, again, stay in this sort of middle ground. The research says that there is enough variability inside an individual teacher prep program that you can't sort of say they are all better, though in the aggregate, they are way better than you'll see where the red circle is, fast track training programs, um, which are documented to underprepare people who also leave the workforce really quickly. On the other hand, deeply partnered teacher residencies, once again, get the thumbs up. So why aren't we all doing deeply partnered teacher residencies? Next slide. There's a barrier. Aspiring teachers cannot work for free in a teacher residency is year long. So they, in across our country, 40% uh, of undergrads, 76% of grads work full time. 20% of those have dependents. The debt that our undergraduate teacher candidates or our master's teacher candidates who came with an undergraduate degree is the same as everybody else with an undergraduate, um, uh, with an undergraduate degree on average, and yet they're going into a profession that pays them less, so they have financial challenges afterwards too. Uh, preventing debt would be a really good idea for teachers. Turns out that college costs are not the big driver for all of that debt. Um, up to two thirds of the cost of college is actually living expenses. So figuring out how to address living expenses, that's kind of, that's like what we really wanna focus on in this work. And if we want diversity in our teaching force, which we do, um, then we need to pay attention to who's out there. And right now in enrollments in preparation programs, Candidates who come from uh, backgrounds that are diverse, that are not white, um, that come from any number of language rich and culturally rich backgrounds have half of the family income available to them compared to the white candidates inside programs. So that's national data linked to actual financial aid packages. So it's really good data. And so we need to address this cost challenge, this barrier because they can't work for free for a year 
and fund themselves without going into crazy debt or working way too many jobs while they're doing a residency full time and while they're finishing their coursework. So we got to address this. Next slide. So funding resident stipends, this is gonna be a return on investment case for the districts. As Hannah mentioned, and she'll do a little bit later, there are other approaches to on the three R's for sustainably funding teacher residencies. Plus we have a federal bid. So there's lots of ways into this. This is a return on investment case for districts. Next slide. So a lot of conversation about why do a teacher residency has really been grounded in turnover reduction. That's the human resources side of a district shop. And it's actually really true. Uh, we spend about, well, some depending on whose analyses you look at and how many kind of hidden costs they are able to uncover and include, we spend between say three and $8 billion a year on turnover and turnover costs in rural areas when you include everything are roughly $10,000 a teacher and turnover costs in urban areas are roughly twice that, 20,000 a teacher. So if I have a year zero teacher every year, then I'm just wasting that money every year, right? So there's a lot of money in turnover costs, um, but there's also a lot of lost money in teaching and learning. So at, if you've heard some of these kinds of ideas before, we really encourage you to take a look at this slide and especially focus on the kinds of things that are draining money from our system because we have underprepared teachers who don't know how to support the students they're serving with culturally responsive and sustaining practices that can help all students thrive. So take a minute to take a look at those ideas. We have very strong research on actual dollar numbers and human resources. And basically every educator I talk to says, yeah. And the piece on teaching and learning is true too. We just don't have the empirical evidence for it yet. Any thoughts or comments on this slide? I'll wait just a minute and we'll go to the next. I'm particularly interested in the, uh, in the research group that wants to take a look at special needs referrals by teacher preparation type. I think that would, that would result in at least as much money as we're finding in the HR turnover side if people are inappropriately referring people to special education. Okay, next slide. When you have residencies, you end up with all of these wonderful benefits, which are the goals of our school districts. Right? And it's not only after you hire them. So even in those less matched for labor market um, historical program models, where you've got an undergraduate who comes and then goes, turns out that they're actually helping instruction in the year that they're a resident. So you're getting strength in instruction, your graduation rates can go up, your school culture can improve, students are staying in school, and you do get an increased long-term tax base for every one student who stays in school um, and graduates who might not otherwise have, and it's as a result of good teachers. Um, that brings the nation about a quarter of a million dollars in revenues and savings, cost and benefits all combined, um, over that individual's lifetime. So just think in your district how many individuals might be helped to graduate if every teacher they had every year was strong, instead of they've had a year zero teacher year after year after year after year because of our turnover challenges. Um, so also your human resources departments, super, super much more efficient and able to focus on the more important aspects of human resources of their talent development. Next slide. So the, if you have initial investments, um, in teacher residencies, then that can result in long-term sustainability for your program. So I'm gonna talk through this slide um, in a little bit of depth, and you'll hear some of the things that Hannah will also talk about specifically from some other reports. So the black bar there is 20% of 100%. Let's imagine 100% is your target, um, your target value for what you want residents to have as a stipend. And let's say that target value is the equivalent of a full-time substitute teacher if you were to multiply by 180 days, whatever your daily rate is. So if every resident subs one day a week, you've covered 20% of that value amount. 
by thinking about some other kinds of role shifts and reinvestments of things like professional development dollars, other places where there's cost savings, we'll talk more about that later, you can increase the investment in your current system. So we're reimagining our systems and what we're investing in over time. And that's that sort of darker blue bar. By year three, you start actually having, having a, a turnover savings. So you're not having to replace as many teachers. So you have more turnover savings. And over time in a district with high turnover, you actually, according to calculations, would start having excess dollars to do more enrichment work with. So that's how the, that can translate into some long-term sustainability. Next slide, and I will pass it over to Hannah. Great, thank you so much, Karen. So now we're faced with two different questions. How can districts fund it and what needs to be funded? How can we really make these shifts to make a stronger teacher preparation uh, program uh, and partnership? So if we can go to the next slide, we're faced with a lot of uh, different upfront costs. And many of these upfront costs will be one time getting the program set up, but really having a strong residency program means deep partnership. And deep partnership means a lot of time spent. We have seen um, partnerships from around the country where people are building this partnership almost as a second job that is unpaid. They are doing heroic work to really uh, link their preparation programs and their district partners together. And startup funding for this can be so beneficial to figure out how to design the partnership for long-term needs. We have uh, partnerships that um, invest this time in various different ways. Some of them started out meeting once a week, if you can believe it, uh, to do design meetings. Um, and then we have other partnerships that might meet once a month or once every couple of months. Uh, but no matter what, creating um, long-term sustainability begins with time spent to plan for it and really create a roadmap moving through building a shared vision for what you want your teacher workforce to look like. So if we can go to the next slide, two other tools can help us do this, reallocation and reduction. So like I said earlier, reallocation is thinking about reallocating roles um, to uh, really uh, move things forward in a cost neutral way. So Karen mentioned substitute teaching. Uh, another option for this could be hiring residents as tutors either during the day or before and after school to run programming and really just making these shifts from using people um, and hiring people that are um, in, the schools now uh, to, but might not have any like long-term stake in teaching to those who are being trained currently to teach. And then reduction um, really provides an important equity lens. If you are coming from a family background that is not as economically advantaged, but might have um, other really critical perspectives to bring into teaching, it's really important that um, our preparation programs meet their uh, potential student uh, potential students, their teacher candidates, where they are, so that they can afford uh, this quality teaching. So there's a number of different ways uh, that preparation programs can do this, um, and whether it be through work study or getting workforce innovation dollars for their students. Um, but really, I think. Um, using all three of these approaches, reallocation, uh, reduction, and reinvestment helps us braid resources together and work in partnership for the good of the teacher candidate and for their eventual students. So this really has an ability to make an impact now in the life of a teacher candidate who this might be, these stipends might be the difference between food insecurity and food security housing insecurity, and being able to have a stable place to stay while they're learning how to teach. Um, so if we can go on to the next slide, um, this really speaks to um, what that investment looks like. So upfront, 
we're going to have a bigger investment that's necessary to be able to fund stipends. But then over time, as our teacher candidates um, become full classroom teachers and stay in our districts longer, we'll have to spend less. And really, uh, we'll be able uh, to harness those savings. So if you uh, can, you can see in this uh, graph here, we have vacancies reduced as uh, the number of teachers that were trained in residencies stay over time. And so we need to make fewer hires. And part of, yeah, you can go to the next slide. Thank you so much. Part of how we can fund this is through federal dollars. How exciting. They already exist and are, uh, we're able to do it. Um, and sometimes it takes the creativity and knowing that like, wait a second, this is possible if I rethink how I'm currently investing uh, my IDEA dollars, my ESSA dollars, and the new ARP ESSER dollars present a great opportunity. So we've got a couple of wordy slides coming up. So I'm going to pause for a second and give you a chance to kind of read them. Yeah, we can go to the next slide. Um, so we can use Title I dollars to improve programming as it is in schools. And so this is you know, the teaching and learning dollars that we're currently spending, that we currently get. So this is me pausing so you can read the slide a little bit. All right, so these dollars are really thinking about how residencies support instruction now. So if we can design residencies where residents are full-time co-teaching, uh, we've seen the benefits of co-teaching in, I believe, Karen, correct me if I'm wrong, as little as one semester for students. That's correct. Um, so that is so powerful and that can make a huge difference. Um, having residencies lowers the uh, student to adult ratio in the classroom. It allows for individualized instruction. So many of these things that Title I dollars are going to support, residencies can be the answer for that. Um, now also we have Title II dollars on the next slide. And I'll pause again for you guys to be able to kind of skim the slide. So one of the really, I think, critical parts about Title II dollars is really thinking about how we're going to support and attract mid-career professionals. So we talk a lot about this with um, some of the more fast-tracked um, entry programs um, where we're trying to bring in people who have previously worked in STEM and now want to use their amazing STEM background and become a teacher. But if you're used to having a STEM salary and you have children to support and uh, you, you know, want to take time off to learn how to become a teacher, it's really hard to be able to uh, work for a year. So um, one of the things that we can spend these Title II dollars on is attracting those mid-career professionals. And because uh, residencies help uh, retain teachers, we're ending up with great teachers with fantastic out of the classroom and in the classroom experience to be able to support their students. Now let's go on and talk a little bit about the AR, uh, so IDEA dollars uh, first. So again, we can, for those uh, candidates that are specifically studying special needs, we can use IDEA dollars as well to support them. And then the ARP funding, um, this graphic here shows all of the different ways um, that residencies really uh, can be a catalyst for better instruction and better recruitment and retention of teachers. And ARP dollars are able to be spent in all of the other different um, previous authorizations. So 
Title I uh, ESSA dollars, uh, IDEA dollars, uh, even uh, Perkins CTE dollars, any of the things that those different areas can be, uh, that you could spend those monies on, you can also spend ARP dollars on those things. And ultimately, we really want to close the persistent opportunity gaps that were exacerbated by COVID-19. There were opportunity gaps that had existed long before COVID that uh, COVID-19 really brought to the forefront and made worse. For example, students without access to reliable internet who are now um, needing to do remote learning. Uh, so ESSER dollars really present a fantastic opportunity uh, to be able to close some of those opportunity gaps. All right, and now um, we're gonna get a little bit more nitty gritty into budget things. And so I'm gonna pass to my colleague Gretchen, who's gonna walk you through a tool that uh, our team constructed over the past year uh, to be able to help you rethink budgets and really reimagine what you might do with them. Hi everybody, I'm Gretchen and I'm going to share my screen so that you all can follow along. Um, I think that you should have a link to exactly the page that I am um, showing you right here that should be in the chat. So if you wanna pull that up and follow along, um, I think that that's really helpful just cause you can enter your own numbers. This is an interactive tool. So uh, we always hope that people are doing their own exploring and kind of playing with budget numbers that they might be more familiar with. Uh, but I will just dive in to the P12 residency funding tool, which is an Excel based tool that is um, hosted on an online platform that makes it super easy to make like graphics, manipulate the numbers. It's hopefully a little bit more user friendly than just a giant spreadsheet. Um, so when you open up the tool, you will see that there's some explanation up top. And then there's tips throughout in, in bullet form uh, about how you can use this tool. And we really recommend reading those because they include some important information about kind of how the tool works, how you might be funding pieces, um, and also just about like, you know, technical things that you need to be thinking about. Like if you're putting in percentages of funding for a district and a school, how funding is split, remember that that shouldn't be over 100%. Um, so the first section of the tool is really just letting us know and getting some numbers into the tool that will help uh, project out from the first year to the fifth year of the, the program. And this is obviously more helpful if you have realistic numbers, but if you are just looking to play with it, that's totally fine too. But if you are looking to actually plan a residency program, it's really helpful to consider how you might be funding residents through two different models. So we have the substitute teaching model um, where, where residents are actually in classrooms um, uh, taking over for, for teachers when they're out. And then we have the paraprofessional position model, which is where they might be splitting time um, between morning and afternoon. So two residents splitting a, a, a full-time paraprofessional role. So we're going to start out by just entering um, numbers for five years for both of those both of those models and then we'll go to the funding so i'm gonna just keep it super basic and we're gonna do an increase each year you can see the graph populating over on the right hand side and these are combined so you can see that we are actually getting both combined over there and we're going to end up with a cohort of, let's see, we've got 14 total in year five. So you can see that that also pops up when you hover above um, on this graph. So pretty much all of the information in these graphs um, is contained in, in your, your numbers here, but they're just trying to make it a little bit easier. So if you want to screenshot any of these graphs, you can save this page as a PDF. Um, use it in your own presentations just to make it easy on yourself so that you're not trying to pull up PowerPoint graphics or Excel graphics, all of the information is right here. So moving on to funding. So we will enter now what we're looking at for financial supports for residents. Um, and this stays the same each year. So, you know, it might be a living stipend of $20,000. 
um, but we but we say financial support. So how much are you going to need to support each resident? And obviously that's going to be proportional to the enrollment. And then we're also going to think about mentors. So each mentor teacher, and there's a one-to-one -one match. That's one of the, the pieces in the tips up here. Um, a one-to-one -one match between residents and mentor teachers. Um, and they are going to get $3,000 a year. So you can see that now we have a color-coded graph with total cost for residents, total cost for mentors, and that goes year by year. So you can see that it is $40,000 in year one. And then as enrollment increases, we're at $280,000 in year five with um, 42,000 for mentors in year five. So again, this is this is just for you to visualize, but obviously this is um, this is just the basic math. And then once we get into the other sections of the tool, um, that is where we kind of start looking at things like reallocation and reinvestment where we're actually saving dollars from your budget and thinking about how those can be added to the residency. I will pause very quickly there to see if anybody has questions. You can feel free to type them in the chat or just shout them out. Um, so I see one question from Nancy. So the living stipend above and beyond pay for the positions, um, or is that the pay? So we recommend having a stipend because of tax purposes, and Karen can obviously go more in depth about kind of the, the logistics of this, but um, for example, if they're substitute teaching, they wouldn't be getting paid for the substitute teaching hours necessarily. They might be getting a living stipend that is doled out similar to a paycheck. Um, and then Amy has a question about funding from other sources like private foundations. We do not have a part in this tool that allows for like, you know, like if you have a baseline, for example, $100,000. Um, but there is a place where you can, ex we, you can download the Excel sheet that this is all run off of. And you would be able to add that in if you have a little bit of Excel expertise by yourself. Uh, but that is something that we could definitely consider adding to kind of indicate and you'll see later on kind of how the funding sections work um, so that you can see kind of like how that might look but for sure that is something that we will consider all right section number two this is reallocation I'm not going to go super in depth here because we had our reallocation conversation a little bit earlier this week and if you were on that you probably got a pretty good demo of this um, but I will just say that the sec this section is going to focus on how much substitute teaching people are doing, um, paraprofessional pay. You can see that we have estimates throughout where you can actually just select um, different numbers. If you're exploring, same with extended day, extended year, miscellaneous hourly, and professional development, which obviously functions a little bit differently, but um, you have options for how to use that. And you don't have to use any of these categories. If you don't fill anything out, it won't be used. Um, you'll get a budget summary for reallocation and then you will move into the reinvestment section. So this is obviously the focus of this conversation is reinvestment. Um, so we have some tips again up here and as uh, Karen mentioned, you're, you're not seeing the accrual of savings in year one. So this, this section is going to look at a few years out, um, but for comparison's sake, you'll see kind of how the, the tool summary happens. Um, so it, it's not all combined in year one as you might for reallocation, which is a more immediate um, savings. So getting into the reinvestment section, the first part that you're gonna look at is recruitment. So this is going to, ask you for the total amount that you're spending on recruitment for um, your district or school, however you're approaching this tool. You can do it kind of either way, depending on if you're entering the number of residents that are going to be in the district up front or the number of residents that are gonna be in a school. So if you are spending, let's just keep these numbers really easy, $100,000 on recruitment each year. And we're gonna say that that is 100% at the school level, um, that is now going to be pushed down into your funding summary down below. So I'm gonna keep on filling this out and then we will go down and check out the funding summary. And I'm gonna do, again, I'm just gonna keep some simple numbers. So again, this is hiring and onboarding savings. 
So thinking about the annual cost of hiring and onboarding all the new teachers that you need. Um, we have some pointers here about things that you might want to think about. Things like incentives, administrative costs, and staffing expenses for when you need to be um, on top of the, the hiring process. So again, we're going to keep this easy and we're, we're just going to keep this at a school level. Um, except I think we will, we'll, we'll put a little bit of district money in just so that it's an easy, easy uh, way for you guys to see how that works. And induction savings, so this is going to be induction and we'll put that as a district 100% cost. Um, training. And termination. So obviously I'm not doing real numbers. We recommend that you go through this with your budget in hand or someone who's knowledgeable about your budget um, sitting next to you. And, oh, there's something going on here, but I'm sure that that is just something that I entered and messed up. But we will scroll down. This is, this is the most interesting part. So we are looking at, um, oh, there it is. All right, so the total potential cost savings for reinvestment. Um, you can see we have a little breakdown here about how our funding is going to flow. So in year one, uh, those categories between training, termination, hiring and onboarding, induction, and recruitment, um, we will be able to partially fund the entire cost of the residency based on the enrollment numbers that we entered. Um, years two through five, we're looking at fully funded and we're actually looking at savings um, starting we have a little bit in year two where we're, we're seeing those numbers pop up. Um, so I will just let you guys look at this. This is where we're seeing year two. We have a little bit of from each category um, and it, you can actually get a breakdown of each one here. Um, you can see those numbers changing. And then you also get this graph. Again, this is something that you can screenshot. You can put into a PowerPoint presentation. Um, you can save it as a PDF and, and forward it over to people. Um, and then here, this is the remaining to fund. So this is where we're looking at actual savings. So you can see that where there's a negative number, that means that we have actually created savings by looking at uh, what would be possible in our enrollment and then what would be possible from savings. Um, this, is, this is reinvestment only. So when you combine reallocation, you can usually find that you're, you're going to have a fully funded program with savings by somewhere in year three, four, I would say, with most times that we've um, tested this with like semi-realistic numbers. Um, and then this funding summary is going to be both of those combined. So as, as I said, I'm not entering reallocation dollars, but this is the whole graph of everything that's possible in this calculator. So um, if you were going to add something like private funding, you would be able to start out with, for example, a baseline um, here to say that you have X amount to invest into this residency um, during each year. And then that would be added into the total dollars available and obviously subtracted from remaining to fund. So this is, this is what it looks like when it's fully done. And I just wanna also point out the school and district funding breakdown. So while I was going through, you guys saw me entering um, the proportion of different areas that was funded by the school versus the district. Um, this graph shows how much is being pulled from each of those levels. So again, it depends on if you're looking at this from a school-based approach or a district level approach um, for how you want to enter those, but we just did a mix so that you guys could see how that works. Um, but once you've completed the whole tool, you will have a ton of really helpful, we hope, numbers and graphs that you will be able to take to planning meetings or put in presentations, share with colleagues, share with your partners. Um, and you can also right here download that Excel file, like I mentioned, save it as a PDF. Um, and we encourage you to get in touch with us about any questions if you're playing with this and something seems off or you're, you're not getting the numbers that you would expect. Let us know if you have something that you would suggest that we should add, um, let us know. But I would definitely say we are open to like any kind of, you know, additions or thoughts on this tool as we are with all of our resources. Um, 
so yeah, so we we would encourage you guys to get on there and explore. And I will now check out the chat for any other questions. I know we have a quick question for Karen that I think she'll be able to touch on. Uh, what are the uh, what areas are you thinking regarding the savings on the instructional side? Uh, can you give a quick example? Yeah, so um, first of all, I've got a kind of a meta comment. Um, we adore that you guys are saying, yeah, and can we do this too? Because that means to us that this is needing some kind of hunger in the field, which is what we have been thinking for a long time. And seriously, uh, we exist to support the field in these important shifts. And so if you've got ideas for what can make things better, let us know and we'll get that in our work streams. We've got a lot of things in our work streams, but we will get to them. Um, so please do send those ideas. You can always email prepare to teach at bankstreet.edu um, and or um, you can email any one of us that you happen to know. So that's one thing there. Um, thanks Gretchen for a super walk through on that tool. So there are a, a couple of questions I think that really are talking about um, some questions around that, that for this particular tool, some questions on how can we work around some of the things that aren't yet in the tool. So for example, the um, external funder, I think there might be some ways, but we'll have to think about how to provide some support. So you're not, you know, everybody's not rebuilding the wheel on their own, um, that there might be some workarounds in that. Um, please be sure to chat Steph if you'd like to be in a conversation, a sort of a mini work group on that, where we'll bring people together for an hour after we figure out what could be possible. Um, and then obviously, if you are Excel literate, then you can just download that Excel sheet and work from that. Um, the second is from Katie about areas regarding savings on the instructional side. So this, as I said earlier, we don't have solid um, estimates of the dollar amounts from this that we can calculate as a sort of a per good teacher cost or a per retained teacher cost. Those data don't exist yet. Those analytics haven't been done yet. Let me give you a, an example of what the research study would be those of you who um, have these kinds of skills and interests and want to do this, just, just contact us because we are all over uh, helping design such a research study. I'm going to go into the special education one. So we know that disproportionate, um, di disproportionate and inappropriate um, referrals into special education exist across the country. So that's, that's just a baseline knowledge piece. In some places it might happen a lot, in other places not so much, but it does happen. And in some places actually quite a lot. If you happen to have that kind of special education referral challenge in your district, the question is, do those inappropriate special education referrals come from teachers who entered the profession underprepared. One might hypothesize that that could be the case, right? So if you could do your analyses about who, which teachers are doing that and what kinds of preparation or certifications they were on, then suddenly you might be able to track the sorts of costs you're needing to spend on the special education referral process and if they end up getting placed, what those extra costs are. That would be a really, really big savings for districts and much more important, a really profound positive impact for students if we could stop that kind of thing from occurring in districts. So that's one thing. Um, the other pieces, which are slightly easier to, uh, to think about uh, getting some cost to, for example, the average weekly after school salary is $600 a week in the country. That doesn't mean yours is, but that's the average. Um, so if you have four days a week of after school for kids who need remediation, and if those remediations could have been prevented because they had two great teachers in a classroom who got rid of that need for remediation, and we know that co-teaching with a student teacher, so just a student teacher, not even a resident who is better prepared, right? Um, co-teaching with a student teacher um, can statistically significantly close gaps, all subgroups. So if that's the case, then you can reduce your expenditures on your remediation costs after school. So that's that whole instructional side of work um, that we believe there's a lot of opportunity to really look at our systems and think about what are we spending our money on? How much of it is actually after the fact 
because we've already not given kids what they need, that we might be able to flip and instead give students what they need in the first instance so we don't have to spend those other dollars. That's essentially the nut of what this set of thinking is about. Any other questions? Thank you, that was super helpful. Can I ask a follow-up question? Of course, Katie. Um, when we're talking about cost savings and around recruitment and things, have you thought about including, and if not, why, um, including a piece around the expected re increased retention of hiring residents over traditionally prepared teachers? I'm just trying to understand your thinking. If you intentionally so left that out. That actually ends up getting calculated in here. Um, I'm pretty sure, right, Gretchen? So that's in the back end, you've got those costs, right? And so those costs, all, you know what though? Actually, Katie, as I'm thinking about it, I think when we were doing the final proof of this, I wondered because those costs are a, a single year instead of five years. So you don't actually capture the reduced cost over time. You're absolutely right. So um, Gretchen, that's another, um, sort of improvement piece. So you're just going to get a year at a time vision in the in those uh, calculations. That's true, Katie. Yeah. So we do absolutely think about it. So you remember the slide where the retention um, me meant that you had fewer positions available? Did you do you remember? Actually, can um, can you, uh, Charlotte? Are you yeah, can you share can you share the two slides that are the charts? You're going to have to sort of flip through the PowerPoint. Sorry, I'll, uh share what part right i'll tell you i'll tell you we want slide get to slide first 13. Okay. so this slide here um, talks about the costs in that those blue bars are they're not just like places on a chart there are real numbers behind these um, that are actually crunched from six different real districts so this is what the projections would be um, and the, the light blue bar there, Katie, that's actually the projections of savings in these districts. These districts have roughly 16 to 18% um, turnover of teachers in their first five years. And then if you will go to slide, if I had a bigger picture here, 17. And this slide is sort of the mirror opposite of that, Katie. So this district had, looks like about, what is that, 425 maybe students uh, every year, people that they hired, not students, but teachers that they needed to hire. So in year one, um, because your folks have just graduated, they still need to hire 425. In year two, it's no different because the people who were in the residencies have not yet retained over and above other new people. But in year three, they start staying longer. And in year four, so does the next cohort. And in year five, so does the next cohort. So this is the visual of how retention actually reduces your need for hiring. Is that helpful? Yes, very. I was thinking about the, the research about it's like residents are 78% more likely to stick around than traditionally prepared. I think it's 58. So um it, yeah. And it actually can go a lot higher than that, Katie, depending on how tightly the program is designed. Some of the programs that are tightly, tightly designed so that, you know, all the way from, you know, really super outreach about people who really want to be part of this district, um, those programs can have up to 95% retention in five years, right? So sort of depends on the program model. Um, I think that the average looks a little bit more like in the 80s, actually. So even a little bit better than 78 And by the way, in this particular report, um, the research is all up front on that, um, along with the citations that we use, in case that's helpful. And then, um, you know, you just unshared, and I think we've just got one more slide, Charlotte, if you wanna go to it, sorry about that. You wanna pick up from yep, where pick we up left slide off 24. Earlier? Pick up slide 24. Gotcha. So really what we, are inviting in particular districts to do, but obviously districts will be able to do this more deeply, more thoroughly, more transformatively if their teacher preparation program partnerships are willing to design in ways that meet districts needs, right? If I'm just trying to do this because districts want to give people money, 
um, then it's gonna be a lot harder for them to make all of this work in their system. But if they are working with their preparation program partners and the preparation program partners understand what are your needs? What are your pipeline needs? What, you know, your hiring needs every year? What are your instructional needs? And how can our program be of support in, in those two areas? Then the districts have a lot more capacity to make these changes. So it is always a partnership but these dollars happen to come more from the district side. So um, these are some of the questions that we think could be helpful for people to explore in their districts. So if you have a lot of fast track programs, see if you can't do some internal analyses about who stays. How much do you think you're spending on this fast track program entrance in terms of triage in their first year, extra professional development learning, extra mentoring, um, and then all those dollars walk out the door. In addition, of course, to your other professional learning dollars that are for all teachers, they walk out the door every year. So you're not really getting any return on investment from those dollars if you've got a, a revolving door of year zero teachers. They're not even year one teachers, right? Um, year zero teachers. Um, so then what kinds of Recurring low return investments or band-aid expenses do you have? So think in terms of things like remediation, right? Um, what are recurring costs in those? Then a lot of districts also have budget lines that annually have unused dollars, but they're like in a different department. And so the people trying to do the residency don't know about it. So how can the whole district come together and explore where are recurring unspent dollars? So for example, do we have a sort of a special pot of saved um, saved uh, salary dollars or long-term sub dollars uh, that we're not using because we've, we're doing some other things. Can you bring some of those recurring unspent dollars into this kind of investment? Um, and then you want to know where there's flexibilities in budget lines and spending. That's why we wanted to share with you Title I, Title II, IDEA, and ERPSA. ESSER, the, all of those can be used. Um, and probably you're actually, we know some schools that are using in California, the, the local uh, funding formula, which I never remember the full name of, so apologies, California. We actually have a report on that. Maybe somebody can find it and chat it really quickly called um, Investing in Residencies, Improving Schools. Uh, we did a case study looking at the budget of a charter school only using its California funding dollars, so not any other dollars. And then we applied those findings to what the same local district was and what their allocations were. Um, and you can see that that local district um, could also do that same thing. Um, so that's another piece. With, even without changing anything, they could do the same thing. Um, and then finally, how can you build a shared vision across the district in particular um, that can guide budgetary shifts towards the long-term investments in schools and communities instead of in that we have to fund this because we've got this gap, we've got this need, we've got this problem. How can we really start bringing this to a place where we're investing? So that's what we're inviting folks to do. And then not that we have to discuss this, but we have a couple of, um, in the next slide, uh, Charlotte, a couple of discussion questions um, and that is like how much in recurring costs that don't bring long-term investments um, might district partners have, let's say over five years. Um, so don't just think about fall, but what could it look like in five years and how can you back map from there? What would you need to answer that question in a formed way? And then there are some things in the bottom to think about which we've sort of touched on across the presentation. So we are now through with slides and we'll take more questions and please feel free to unmic if, um, you're not a lover of chatting, or you need some Friday afternoon voice. And, Patty, um, is, that a, is that a dog that wants to join our, our meeting? We're so proud that we're attractive to puppies. Yay! <laughs> he gets very needy in the afternoons. <laughs> yep. He's our faithful afternoon companion at Branch. <laughs> One of the things I was thinking about um, being newer to thinking about residency models is if you are trying to create this partnership, um, do you have people found it easier to work with, like start small and scale up or kind of start big with some small pieces and scale that way? 
So that's a really good question. And there are, um, there are a lot of sort of mini case studies out on that. Um, US Prep has, uh, I think a couple on, no, is ed Education First um, just sent one about how folks have scaled. Um, I think it varies a lot by size of program, by who your current faculty are. So I would actually say, Amy, that that's a less important question than this one. If you are gonna start small, are you separating this program out from the rest of your conversations about what your program does? Because if you are, it's not ever gonna scale. Um, you will be trying to find money for a director over here, find money for your budget person over here. Find, and so that's gonna make this more expensive. And not only that, so let's say, Amy, that you do this wonderful residency, you know, you've got this wonderful model over here and none of the rest of the faculty have been involved. How do I feel about it when people come talk to me about your great program, when I'm doing the other version of that programming? I feel like, what am I, chop liver? You know, she got this startup grant, right? And so that's a bit of the dynamic challenge in thinking about how you want to start up. So from our perspective, the, our, our suggestion is that you start the conversations as what would it look like to change our whole system? You don't say we're going to change our whole system today. But you get the, you get the ownership of this idea that we should shift in this direction across the board on both sides. And then you strategically figure out, for our context, does it make sense to start with a few people in several programs, with one whole program, with one district meeting their needs? So thinking about those kinds of things, once you have established that your goal is to make the shifts, that would be our recommendation. Um, and then locally, you figure out what the right individual plan would be for your site. Is that helpful? Yes, thank you. I'm also thinking like on the K-12 side, like what is m most, um, you know, um, attractive to them. But I think that's going to be probably based on like to start, but, but on those scale models, you know, is it better to kind of start big and trickle down or start small and like lots of work in one small area and, and push up? But so I that's think a, it's a really, really great uh, question. By chance, do we have anybody from the Western Washington Ferndale Partnership? I don't think we do. I think they've had to go. Um, so we have a report on that too, about how Western Washington um, started that work in uh, with the partnership in Ferndale. Um, yeah, so Bill is actually, Bill, you're in Mount Vernon though, right? Yeah. So he, yeah. So Steph is saying, we have Bill here. <laughs> she saw you. <laughs> so did I. Um, so we have a report on, they, they did a report on how they approached it, Amy. And they started saying, let's come together with the leadership on both sides. And let's talk about where our gaps and needs are and see where we can find mutual benefit. And that first year of work designed a very good, robust pilot that was not isolated in conversation from all the rest of the program. And because they were starting with meeting mutual needs, they continued this, what is our vision work? Um, and so now they are with another partnership that Bill Nutting is from in, in Mount Vernon. They're all working together to figure out what does a coherent pathway of grow your own from high school with social, emotional, and academic supports all the way through, along with financial supports all the way through. What does that look like so that people don't like go through a high school program and then disappear, right? They actually are, are brought into a well-articulated, well-thought-of, well-cohorted kind of a system. So both, um, so all of them together are thinking about that, including questions at a university level about what do we at universities need to do and when we have this new group of people in to make sure that they really see themselves and feel themselves as part of this work. Thank you. And thank you to Gretchen for dropping that report. I appreciate it. Any other questions or thoughts? I have a few things that I would love to add about the ARP resources. Uh, one is that 
residencies aren't actually automatically included in this. Uh, so we are currently right now petitioning different state ed uh, agencies in order to be able to get residencies to include this. We realize uh, that the various LEAs are going to have a lot of different um, competing needs for this funding, but we want LEAs to be able to decide on their own if residencies are going to meet their needs. And so in order to do that, it has to be written into state plans um, and the due date for those state plans is June 7th. So if you want to reach out to us to get some of that language around um, the different areas that we think residencies can really um, be very useful funding and turn this one-time funding into a sustainable system shift, um, then you should definitely reach out to us and we will send you um, editable suggested language uh, that you can send to your state education agencies. Can I add another clarification? Of course. So, so here's the weird thing. So actually it's completely technically already included. It's actually been technically included since back with No Child Left Behind. We just haven't believed it's been included. And so if you happen to have state ed people um, who don't believe it's included already um, and they don't include it in their plan, then you may get a no inside your state because of the lack of understanding of the potential inclusion. And so what you're looking for is making sure that a person who doesn't yet get that this is eligible because it is already eligible under Title I and Title II, um, that they actually see the language inside the document. And so you don't have to sort of have them go to their federal Title I, Title II guidance person and have a big conversation and a big to-do about it. So that's what we're really trying to do is smooth the path. Mm -hmm. um, and further evidence that it's already doable is that the Biden administration specifically wrote in $2.8 billion for residencies and grow your own programs into the American Families Plan. Uh, so very exciting to see movement on that uh, front as well. So hopefully we will be able to, to get that written into law soon. And I think one of the one of the kind of the, the worst case scenario, even if you do have uh, state actors that are trying to block direct funding um, towards the residency, there's still explicit language in ARP that allows you to use funding uh, towards ESSER, uh, towards ESSA, IDEA, other prior funding streams um, that you'll actually be able to put towards specific funded roles for residents um, if for some reason you're blocked at, at, at the state level. And that's because in the Title II guidance before the administration shifted over, um, there were some of us who were working with the former, the Obama administration on guidance on ESSA when it came through. Um, and we did get residencies um, included inside um, the ESSA Title II guidance document. Zach, you might be able to find that and, and, and sort of just give that general link um, as the evidence there. And one of the pieces that's sort of core here that was part actually of those conversations that we had with players across the country and also with about 20 different folks in different offices at the US DOE, and we submitted public comments and all of those things, is that with No Child Left Behind, um, we talked about recruiting and retaining. Like how many of us, like just like off the, off the tip of our tongues talk about recruiting and retaining teachers, right? Just sounds natural, right? That was actually an express decision um, that was lobbied and there's something missing there. And it's actually the glue between recruiting and retaining and that's preparation. Because if you don't prepare, so you learn to teach, then you're not really gonna be retained. We know that the turnover is huge from those fast track programs. And so it's the preparation portion that got written into the title one dollars because of the evidence that if you don't have strong preparation, you're unlikely to stay in the, in the field. And so preparation is actually already written in to title two eligibility. Therefore, it's also actually already written in to all of the ESSER funds.
Well, it is a Friday afternoon and I know nobody. Oh yeah, can you can you find the actual federal guidance? If you search for guidance, I think you can find it. Um, that is a document that the US DOE vetted, the ESSA opportunity. You can take a look at that if you'd like. That's one of ours that the DOE vetted for us. Um, and Zach is going to try to find the actual federal guidance on Title II, which is somewhere in our files. Um, got a lot of files. But it's Friday afternoon. I'm sure folks would love to have a little bit of time back. We hope ever. Oh, some Amy, you've got your Amy V, you've got your hand raised. Talk to I just. I just had one one question that I was just thinking about in terms of what are you know you talked about the the money that you're using to fund the the residents and um, that that the a good portion of what they need is for living costs. So what is what are some examples of the ways that you actually uh, channel that money to them? Does it go go through universities? Because like our main method is to credit an account or to an award a scholarship, but then a lot of times you know, it doesn't necessarily funnel back to them for the purposes that they need. So how do you, what are the ways to right. get the money to the people? So that is, that is a great question. Um, and it is a challenging question. So there are, there are pluses and minuses on all sides, unless you can manage this one that only has pluses. So I'll tell you the, the two big sides. So um, I guess there's three. One is they actually become hired by the district and they get a full salary and benefits, right? If they have a full salary and benefits, they actually may not get as much in financial aid for their tuition, but they do have salary and benefits. And so that could be okay, right? Um, so that's, that's one sort of thing. Another is that they are in the district. You have a, a, a licensure um, indicator that, a, that is sort of like a floating instructional support person who's gone through whatever your selection process would be to say they're available to call it sub, but we're just gonna call it a floating instructional support person. Um, and they can fill in in different places and they're getting a stipend for all of that work. Cause when you get a stipend in schools, it, it's not subject to FICA withholding and some other kind of withholding that I'm not remembering right now. And so the take home level is a little bit higher for them. So that has a benefit. If it comes to schools and it credits their tuition, then the downside is if I was qualified for a Pell Grant, suddenly I don't have my Pell Grant. I needed that money to live on. My Pell Grant has disappeared because now you've paid for my account, you know, that other way. So that's not so fun either. So here's the ideal. The ideal is get those dollars to fund full-time work study positions because work study dollars do not count as income against your financial aid packaging. So work study with the university or with it? Yeah, so um, so we just did in the, in the, so if you can chat against it, uh, we know we got a lot of resources. And if you got follow-up questions, say, what one was that that you were talking about? <laughs> we get it, so just ask us again. Um, but in the, um, the affordability imperative, we talk a, a lot about work study. There's a lot we sort of have misconceptions about around work study. So both that report and the webinar associated with that report talk about how, Work study was always intended to support, let's call it real life, working while you study so you can learn about your profession, always. But it became really, um, certainly in my days, it, you know, how to fill, get, get help on campus at a minimum wage job, right? That's what it was when I went through. But actually, you could have a work study job um, in a nonprofit and get $20, $25 an hour I don't know. I know some folks that work at Columbia with us. There we go, Hannah. So she qualified for graduate level work study. Another thing we don't think is possible, but it is. We have every year anywhere between three and 12 work study students from Columbia, most at the graduate level, and most are making between 18 and $22 an hour. Totally viable. Um, the reality is that institutions may run out of their dollars. Um, so we actually, in that webinar, and you can you know, you can see the links and all of that in that webinar, there, there's links to where you can find out if your institutions use all their dollars and all, there's a lot of stuff to that. 
but you can have those dollars come to fund a work study position that happens to be there. So they could give dollars for work study instead of to individual students accounts. And those work study dollars then could go to candidates, right? And the work study dollars, they can pay 100% out of that. Um, districts also can pay the 25% matching fee. I know I'm sorry, I, I, I need my, I need to talk through this more slowly. I understand it all, but I get that I've already lost a few, a few threads. It's a pretty complex system, um, but, but there's basically, there is a 25% match in most institutions. Probably in most of your Alaska institutions, they have a waiver on that match um, because of a, a qualification that I'm sure the institutions have applied for. But many institutions have to pay 25 cents on the dollar for any work study that's expended. Um, and so if you do work study off campus, the districts can pay that. So they could put the 25% into that pool in addition to the other ESSA funds just to support the work study, or they could just pay 100% of the work study cost as part of the agreement. Um, thank you so much for joining us. You know where we are. Um, so visit the website. It's been a great week. Great, Patty, I'm glad it was good for you. Let us know how we can get stronger too.